Well, our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 22. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Are you going to follow along on the screen uh, if you've printed off the service in the service sheets or in your pew Bibles at home? Though I don't think many of us have pews at home. Let me read Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 22. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And they were all speaking well of him. They were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's a sermon outline there, and uh, you can follow along on the screen. Uh, you can take notes. You can send questions using uh, the question box at the bottom of the page. And let me encourage you to do that. Uh, let me also remind you that our summer study series uh, is meeting each Sunday in the summer period of January on the uh, Vicarage lawn uh, at 5 o'clock, BYO dinner, 6 o'clock for a Bible study, 7 o'clock we hunt you out the gate and send you home. If you'd like to join us, please do so. Uh, everywhere you looked over the last fortnight, there were images of brokenness, not really that different to any other fortnight in the last 12 months. Uh, on a large scale, uh, we saw headlines about democracy broken as people stormed the Capitol in Washington, uh, as National Guard slept there as people were preparing for the inauguration of Biden as US President. On a local level, uh, we had a lamb ad released by Meat and Livestock Australia, which played on the idea of a broken Australia and the result of border closures and the idea of walls going up between states, even at a sporting level. The saviour of Australian cricket, our current captain, Tim Payne, was shown to be broken as he fell apart under pressure and the crowds at the SCG resorted to alleged racial insults. At the end of such a week, uh, I was chatting to a gentleman from amongst our congregation and he described the world not just as broken but as shattered. Uh, into this kind of world, we desperately need good news, don't we? And we want good news that's not just about good feelings and warm fuzzies and smiles, things that make us happy on the outside. We desire good news that will restore what is broken at every level right down to the root course. What I love about Jesus is that he comes to proclaim that good news is here, that now is the time of restoration. And we're going to look at that this morning. Let me pray and we're going to dive into the passage. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Luke. Thank you for Theophilus. Thank you for Luke writing this account of the lifetimes, work, claims, power of Jesus. Thank you that you persuaded Theophilus, we assume, of the truth of this. Thank you that we can read it now. Father, thank you that in Jesus we hear the announcement that good news is here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And stood up to read. I'm at point two on the outline. Jesus came home. Nazareth was the town he'd been brought up in. Uh, coming home, Jesus had a habit. Well, not just coming home. It seems that every week he had the same habit. He attended the public gathering of God's people. Uh, this was at the local synagogue, the gathering place for God's people, the Israelites in that town. Just think on that for a second. Jesus made it a habit to be at the public gathering of God's people. This time, he stood up to read. Jesus showed publicly that he wanted to both read God's word and then explain it. Now, he already had a reputation as a gifted teacher. Verse 14, Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being acclaimed by everyone. In fact, Luke has built gradually to this moment from the baptism of Jesus in Luke 3, 21 to 22. There Jesus was publicly identified as the Son of God. Immediately afterwards, this was proven not just by the voice of God, but by Luke tracing Jesus, 
historically verifiable genealogy. Uh, the temptation of Jesus in Luke 4, 1 to 13, which we'll look at next week, showed this identity being tested and found to be true. And now as Jesus moves around his home region, he's proving it by his practice and proclamation. Here in his home synagogue, as he stands up to take the reading and to teach in the local gathering of God's people, all this is bubbling away in the minds of those watching, those listening. The reputation of this man precedes him. As Jesus stands, look at verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. And they didn't have sermon postcards or Facebook to advertise sermon series back then. But when the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus, I suspect that you could hear everyone's brain cogs starting to work. It's worth pausing and thinking of the pieces that might have been being put together in people's minds as they sat there and watched as this scroll was handed over, as Jesus found the place and as Jesus read. In fact, to sit with these people, at least in our minds and hearts, and to think their thoughts after them is helpful for understanding what Jesus is claiming here. When he stood up to read, this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, verse 18, because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The people seated in front of Jesus would have known their history. As Jews, as members of the nation of Israel, they knew that their identity had its roots in the magnificent commitment of God to this world through one family, the family of Abraham. Remember Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3? There God had committed publicly in history to roll back sin in this world, to restore it to the blessing that he had created it for, to his approval. We know what sin is since the attitude and action that says, I'm God, God's not. We know that sin is part of every fibre of our being as human beings. Our default setting is now sin. Sin brings God's judgment. We know that separation from him and brokenness in the world and death in our future. God committed to Abraham's family to deal with this problem for the world. And that, in essence, is the grand restoration project that God has committed to through this family for the benefit of all. The people seated in front of Jesus would have known their place in this restoration as the promise of God passed through solid commitment through Abraham to his son Isaac to Isaac's son Jacob, then through Jacob to a nation of 12 tribes, God gathered his people to give him a central job in his promise of restoration. Remember Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 8? Abraham's family there was given the job of priests. They were to represent God to the world, to the world that he'd made. And through this, people would be restored to the true knowledge of God and brought back to him, his people brought back to him. And so the life of Abraham's family was to be a living, breathing example of God's commitment to roll back sin and bring blessing. Their whole culture, as you read after that commitment there in Exodus, their whole culture from child rearing through to cuisine, from clothing, even to the way their calendar worked, their whole culture was to display the nature of God so that the world would know God. In essence, that's always been the job of humans, really, hasn't it? When you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 26, now it was entrusted to Abraham's family. In fact, this nation was to live in such a way that the world would not only see the nature of God, but also what God's restoration would look like. The restoration of God's people dwelling with God in God's place under God's rule and blessing by God's word. Remember that series we did last year? God's big picture. And central to all this was the reality of the problem of sin and how to deal with it. Sin brings the judgment of God. And so God gave his people a sacrificial system so that the judgment fell on animals all the time instead of on humans. Sin broke the very existence and lives of humans, their relationships, their community. And so God gave the idea of restoration in the Jubilee year, that reading we had from Leviticus 25. Their calendar was organised so that every 50 years there would be this period of grand restoration for a year 
where people were freed from slavery, property that was forfeited returned, the whole community restored to what it should be. And together all of this painted a picture of what God had committed to through Abraham's family. But it painted a picture. It didn't deal with the root cause of all the brokenness or all the damage or all the death. It painted a picture of what God would do one day. It was a series of road signs pointing towards a destination. In fact, Abraham's family struggled to even do these things in such a way. That painted a true picture. Sin remained a constant issue and God's commitment pointed forward to a time when he would deal with sin once and for all. Now, the people sitting in front of Jesus would have known that they'd failed in their job to be priests for God, to represent God to the world. As Jesus called for the scroll of Isaiah, they would have known what Isaiah was all about. You see, Isaiah was a prophet. Isaiah was a man commissioned by God to speak for God, to God's people. He was sent by God to confront God's people about their failure to represent God to the world, to confront God's people with their sin, to call God's people back. God continually calls on his people to turn away from their sin, to turn back to him. They will be judged, wiped out, removed if they don't. In fact, their continual stubborn refusal to listen to God means that he does judge them. They will be removed from the land that was a picture of dwelling with him. And in that judgment, God will save a remnant, a small group, And that will be a picture of his desire to restore his people. Isaiah is all about that salvation through judgment, but even that small mob, even that remnant, even that restored mob fails again and again and again. And so God says very clearly in Isaiah, one day there will be one man and he will be everything the one people of God should have been. He will deal with the root cause, that one man. He will deal with sin itself. And all the pictures that God has painted throughout history through his people, the pictures of the sacrifice and the pictures of the restoration of the Jubilee year and the picture of the time of rest, all of those will come to their climax in this one man. In the book of Isaiah, he's called the servant, the one chosen by God. He would represent God truthfully. He would relate to God rightly. He would be perfectly human so that he would be judged in the place of humans, like that picture of the sacrifice. He would live, die and rise again, showing that God himself has dealt with sin once for all, restoring that relationship like the year of Jubilee looked forward to. And that servant, that servant would be the end point of God's commitment to restore his world, his people, by rolling back sin, bringing blessings through the family of Abraham. So, When Jesus stands up to read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, all of these pieces are floating around in people's minds and hearts and expectations, their desires, their history, their collective memory. Moreover, they are sitting there under oppression. They're sitting there in their own land, occupied by the Roman Empire, dispossessed, oppressed, captive, suffering. And so there's a really sharp edge here to their hopes and dreams as this scroll is handed to Jesus for him to read. And as Jesus reads that passage, you can imagine all their hopes rising. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. It's a quote from Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. It's an announcement passage. God has chosen the person speaking here who could quite possibly be that servant I just mentioned. He's chosen this person speaking here to make an announcement to the world, to make an announcement to God's people in the world. Now is the time of good news. Now. Is the time of good news. And the good news to be announced is the news of restoration. And when you look through those verses, they're all pictures of restoration, things being restored. And the poor will have hope. The captives will have freedom. The blind will see. The oppressed will be made whole again. It's a statement that the Jubilee year, all those pictures from the life of the family of Abraham have come to their climax now. 
Now is good news. God now has brought good news and he is going to deal with the cause of all the brokenness. Sin is going to be dealt with. And those images from the passage that Jesus has just read are concrete. But they also work on a bigger level. They're images of people damaged and broken and dependent because of, because of sin. The poor are impoverished because they've been broken by the greed of the world. The captives are those damaged by the violence of war. The blind are those feeling the sharpness of a world that is warped. The oppressed are those deprived by the invaders. But they're also images of what happens when you come under the power and the rule of sin. You become impoverished. You are less than human. You become captive because you are enslaved to sin. You become blind because the light of God has been removed from you. You are oppressed because you follow desires that take you away from God. Sin impoverishes people, it captures people, it enslaves people, it blinds people, it breaks people. And when Jesus stands up and reads that passage, he is saying the good news is here. In the big schema of God's calendar, the time now is the time of good news. And Jesus also teaches. He's not just the reader of the passage. He's the teacher of the passage. I'm at point four on the outline. Look at verse 20. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. Now that reading would have captured anyone's attention at that point. Remember their context? Enslaved, oppressed, invaded, dispossessed by the Romans in their own land. After all, in a situation where you're desperate for some good news, some restoration, wouldn't you pay attention to that reading? And as everyone watches, Jesus speaks very clearly, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. What a statement! But be careful. Be careful as you listen to it, as you think about it. We need to listen and look very carefully. The quotation Jesus has just read, this quotation, is focused on announcement. Did you see how many speaking verbs were there? To preach, to proclaim, to proclaim. This is a quotation about announcement. And it has just been fulfilled in their hearing. Jesus has just announced that the time of restoration is here. Now, Jesus has just announced that he is the one who has come to announce this. In the next few weeks, we'll see how he accomplishes it. But here he's announcing it. Jesus is announcing that restoration, good news, is here now. And that restoration uses concrete images, but it's talking about the heart of the brokenness. It takes the image of the jubilee year of complete restoration and says the picture that the jubilee year painted will now happen in real time and space. And it has an end point, this announcement. Now, it's not an announcement with an offer, with a statement that is going to continue on eternally for the people who are listening. No, there's an end point. Did you notice the end point as we listen to that reading from Isaiah 61? Did you notice what Jesus left off? The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's where the quotation stops, but it goes on in Isaiah, and the day of our God's vengeance. Jesus left that off because it's still coming. There's an end point to this announcement. Now is the time of good news. Restoration is going to happen, but there's an end point, and the end point is the day when Jesus returns. Now, it's a big call, isn't it? I'm at point five on the end. It's a big call. And you can imagine the excitement on the one hand, can't you? Look at verse 22. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Imagine hearing such gracious words, such amazing words, such mind-blowing, stunning words that said, restoration is here now. I want to announce to the world, to the people of God, restoration 
is here now. What you have wanted, what you have misunderstood, what you have desired, what you've never had, it's here. But it also doesn't quite fit with their preconceived ideas because look at the end of verse 22, yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? I mean, Joseph's boy, come on. Come on. Now, we know he's special, but we know him. This town knows him. He's come over for sleepovers. We've watched him as a first-year apprentice. We've seen him grow from a boy into a man, from, a, from an apprentice to a tradie, from a child to a carpenter. And yet he stands up and says, this is me, this is happening now through me, connected with me, that he's the chosen messenger of God to announce that restoration is here. No chance. And so they reject him. Rejected outright by those who knew him best. He doesn't fit their understanding of restoration or the messenger to bring it or how it should come about, and so they reject him. It's so often the case with Jesus, isn't it? Even amongst the people who claim to be his mob, they reject him because he doesn't fit what they desire, perceive, or want as a restoration, as good news. Even those claiming to be God's people can take a passage like this and make it about good deeds and make it about social transformational revolution or even violent revolution as parts of South America have experienced. Even more so, Jesus doesn't seem to bring the good news the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it, in what form we want it, in the way we have planned, and so he he gets rejected. The good news is that Jesus is announcing that he's come to deal with sin, that sin will be dealt with, that the root of all brokenness, all damage, all dislocation, all death, Jesus is saying that the time of dealing with that is now. That means that the good news of sin being dealt with is connected with him and him alone. That's why I love him. Because dealing with Jesus deals with the restoration that God has promised. He has come to bring an end to sin, to bring the restoration of everything that sin has stained and strained and tarred and warped and broken. He doesn't come with a face mask with unlimited hand wash and the required social distancing. Instead, he's actually come to deal with the root cause of the virus, with sin, with the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. He's come to deal with sin. And in this world, that is good news. Now, the cause of our brokenness has been dealt with, announced. And over the next three weeks, we're going to see what that looks like. We'll unpack it. But today, what I love about Jesus is that he announces good news. It's available to everyone. Now, when you read a little further, you'll see that it's available to widows who are impoverished and dispossessed right through to high-flying army generals who roll about in their wealth. It's available to anyone from any place, any nation, any skin colour, any educational background, any employment history. It's available to any human being. It's often to every person who is made by God. It's announced to all humanity. But let me hasten to make this point. There is an end point. The day when Jesus will return, his second coming. There is a day when such an offer of good news will cease. There is an end point. What I love about Jesus is that he announces he is good news. Let me encourage you in this world that is so broken and damaged. Just remember those images I used at the start. Good news of restoration comes by dealing with Jesus because he has come to deal with the root cause of our brokenness. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for Jesus standing up in that hometown synagogue and proclaiming, uh, announcing, reading that the time of good news is now, that this is about dealing with sin. Uh, Father, help us to hear that. Help us to listen to that. Help us not to reject that, but to come to him. Uh, Father, over the next few weeks as we unpack what that looks like, why Jesus can do it, please enable us uh, to know the goodness of his restoration. In his name we pray. Amen.